Today is Thursday, March 14, 2024, coming up on Roller Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. The Service Employee International Union, representing more than 2 million healthcare, property service, and government workers, are going to be spending about $200 million to get voters of color to support President Biden, Vice President Kamala Harris, one of the top SEIU officials.
Uh, and so let's talk about th this campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it going to uh, involve? What is it going to entail? Uh, our campaign that we've really started to kick off a year ago is aimed at uh, targeting six million. Uh, we call them high opportunity. Other call them low propensity mm -hmm. voters, primarily voters of color um, in key battleground states across the country. And we know that when we talk to voters of color, young voters, immigrant voters, we can change the game. Mm -hmm. And these are the voters that the Biden-Harris ticket, as well as other down ballot Democrats, have to turn out in record numbers right. if they're going to win in November. And when you say talk to them, uh, we, 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 we've said this n numerous times, mm -hmm. numerous times we've said this, that part of the issue is that uh, it tends to, there is research that shows it, Cornell mm -hmm. Belcher's polls show it, and these focus groups, that these voters, one, don't know what's been done, mm -hmm. but then once informed what's been done, then they have a completely different view uh, of, of the candidates. That's right. And it's, it's, I believe, these voters need to be talked to by folks they trust mm -hmm. and that can speak to them in ways that they understand, culturally competent. Right. Right. How are we sending folks out canvassing who look like them, who are from their communities, who do the same work that they do? It's not just a commercial. It's not just a posting on social media. It's me looking you in your right. eye and saying, I come from where you come from, and we are in this, and we don't do this together. But also what I say is connect you the dots. Yes. So, perfect example, um, um, and I've said this to the Don Harris campaign, mm -hmm. uh, you could spend millions of dollars if you want running 30 seconds, 60 second ads. Mm -hmm. The reality is you actually have to walk people through uh, and explain uh, this policy, yes. build back better, the infrastructure bill, how these things have been, made an impact, uh, which means that what I've said, what I've said on the show, what I've said to them, I said how I see it. I said me personally, I said January to August should be what I call an education enlightenment uh, campaign where you're hosting conversations nationwide. You're in uh, these various places. You're talking to community groups and literally saying, no, what are your questions? Mm -hmm. And then this is what has been done. Yeah. And getting folks that sort of data, you don't get that in campaign commercials. It has to be this vigorous engage, education engagement process. That is continuous. Right. That doesn't just exist from Labor Day to Election Day. Like you said, it starts in January. We've already talked to 900,000 voters um, since the, the, the end of last year because we knew we had to start early with that education. We've had roundtables. We've done focus groups. And here's the deal. We've laid out, this is what the Biden administration has done. And voters have looked at us and said, no, they didn't. We don't believe you. That didn't happen. Because they, never, they didn't hear it. Because they didn't hear it. And they don't feel how it has impacted their lives. So we have to not only educate them, but help them connect the dots, as you just said, right. on how it has real impact on how they live. Absolutely. Uh, and so, uh, so your target, you said, it's, uh, you said it's six to nine million? Six million voters. Six million voters. voters. Mm -hmm. And have you identified where? Well, what states? So we are in the battleground states where you would expect us to be. Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. We also have large constituencies in California and New York where the House will be decided. So we're going to do work there in those congressional districts. We're also going to play in states that are key to maintain control of the Senate, Ohio, Montana. Right. We're also going to do work in Georgia, North Carolina, because we believe we can't leave the South behind. Because also, and again, because when you're talking about it, and again, this is what, again, trying to get people to understand. <laughs> yeah. First of all, uh, if you don't focus on Tester in Montana, yes. Brown uh, in Ohio, yes. uh, the race uh, in Nevada, yes. the race in Arizona, yes. then you can't control the United States Senate. Mm -hmm. You've got the race in Texas, some polling show all red is tied with Cruz. Cruz lost by two points, excuse me, won by 2.5 points. But then the question is, okay, how do you get folks out there? You've got some 2.9 million eligible black voters in Texas. You've got 75% uh, of young voters, 30 and under, uh, who didn't even vote in the 2022 midterms, and Ben O'Rourke was running for governor. Uh, and so, so there are pickup opportunities if time, energy, and money is invested in those places. That's exactly right. And we got time, we got energy, and we got a little bit of change. And so we are going 
going to make sure we invest our resources in the places where we feel like we have the most impact, where we have a strong base of members, where we have strong ties with uh, civil rights groups and civic participation groups that are on the ground with us. And we think that we are poised to help make a difference in this election. We did, uh, and, and this was something that was, it was interesting, I was on the phone earlier with uh, Virginia House Speaker Don Scott, and we were talking about uh, what we did uh, last fall. Uh, and so Don saw, Don saw what I did in Georgia with Warnock. He said, hey, I want you to do that for us. So what they then did is they came to us, and they said, hey, we want to advertise on your network. We also want you to bring your show to Virginia. These are the five cities we're looking at. We're targeting African Americans, broadcast the show from there, create it sort of in a town hall uh, sort of way. We had every candidate who was in those house races uh, on, uh, and most of them won. But what was interesting, there were people who were telling him, okay, why are you doing that? This makes no sense. He said, you don't understand. He said, you're focused on 75 or 80 or 100 who showed up at, at the town hall. He said, but thousands saw the video mm -hmm. and they saw the clips. Uh, and so he was trying to explain to them, you have to campaign differently. Yeah. He said, if you, if you run a campaign, you're just dumping all of your money on television. He said, that ain't going to do it. How do you how do you reach voters in a totally different way? Uh, and they got so much feedback from people who said, "Hey, I was at work, I couldn't get I couldn't get off to ten, but I watched it online. I saw the restream, I saw the clips later." Uh, and that's sort of the thing that, that that we're trying to explain to a lot of these campaigns, these, these these a lot of these consultants who are so locked on television. And I keep saying, "You you got a totally different world now with voters the voters that you did." Uh, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and COVID changed a lot of that as yes. well. How we are now engaging. And so it's not just about, oh, getting somebody on MSNBC, ABC, CNN. No, you've got influential podcasts on the digital platform yeah. that are reaching people. Look, the, the reality is that part of the reason the election costs so much is because there are people making money hand over fist. Right. Right? Trying to tell uh, candidates, this is what you got to do to get somebody's vote. And so much money is made by consultants and folks who produce television commercials and mail pieces. And I'm not mad at them, right? You know, get your bag. But we also, as you just talked about, have to go where voters are. So we will see our money spent um, making sure we can talk to people on the doors, we can reach them on the telephones, and yes, we can reach them through their social media platforms. Mm -hmm. We can reach them through the places where they go to receive their news. And, and we want to make sure we leave something behind. Mm -hmm. Like, this isn't just about mobilizing voters. This is about mobilizing and creating power yep. in our communities that live beyond elections. Because we also have to be full participants in our democracy, not just as voters, but as a citizens who demand more from their government. And that happens right after the election. Hold on one second. Of course, we go to break. We come back. Uh, my panel has uh, some questions. Uh, as well, so we'll do that when we come right back on Rolling My Unfiltered on the, Bla on the Black Star Network. Back in a moment. I need you to scream.
folks, welcome back to Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Now, okay, so a lot of y'all on YouTube, so let me explain to y'all what's going on. So we have no idea what's happening with the audio on YouTube. No idea why it is distorted. It's not us. Uh, if you look and listen to the audio that is on the Facebook feed, clean. This is the audio on the Black Star Network app. It's clean. So uh, the distortion is happening from YouTube. Uh, and so um, what we're going to try to do, so Keenan, let me know. We're going to continue the feeds on all of the platforms. We're probably going to turn off the YouTube feed and turn it back on. Hopefully that fixes uh, what the audio problem is. And so everybody who's on YouTube right now, uh, just uh, if we turn it off, just come right back. Uh, but we're trying to actually fix the audio. So I'm, see I'm seeing all of y'all text messages. It's okay. I'm seeing everything y'all saying right now. Uh, but again, on the other platforms, uh, the audio is fine. So it is a distortion of a problem that is there on YouTube. And so we're on the phone with them as well, trying to figure it out. Uh, we're talking with the Secretary Treasurer of the SEIU, April Verrett. She joins me in the studio about this $200 million campaign. They're going to be uh, they're launching when it comes to this election. Uh, questions from our panelists. Uh, we've got uh, three of our panelists here. Let me introduce them. Dr. Greg Carr, Department of Afro-American Studies at Howard University. Uh, Rebecca Carruthers, Vice President, Fair Election Center out of Washington, D.C. Gavin Reynolds, contributor to The Root and former speechwriter uh, to Vice President Kamala Harris, uh, New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, Rebecca, your question first for April. Hey, April, it's good to see you. Um, I was on Capitol Hill all day with the Black Women's Roundtable. I was with activists from all across the country and especially the battleground states that you just mentioned. Now, I am excited to see that SEIU is going to spend $200 million. How much of that money is going to go to Black-led organizations or organizations that are doing specific work and are boots on the ground? Or is the majority of this ad buy um, going to direct mail into like some of the traditional um, um, campaign vendors. So thanks for the question and shout out to my girl Melanie Campbell at the Black Women's Roundtable. The majority of our $200 million spend is going to be on direct voter contact. It's going to be on doors. It's going to be on phones. And there will be some that's put on in traditional advertising as well as social media and other ways to reach voters. And it's going to be spread out as we feel like we need to stay dependent on different communities of color and different workers. So it's going to be in the black community and the Latino and the API and other immigrant and communities of color, as well as reaching um, low propensity white working class voters. But we feel like the, that our lane right out right away in this cycle is reaching out to low propensity voters of color and young voters. So that is where we're going to spend our money. And we also spend it on the ground with indigenous folks who have real sway in our community. So we work with the Black Women's Roundtable, with the NAACP, you know, with other groups who have real um, uh, history with reaching out and talking to voters, uh, both traditional groups and, and newer groups. And so we're really proud of, of, of our record and how we've engaged voters in the past um, and know that our members are trusted voices and, and they will be out talking to their neighbors and their families and their friends. All right, then. Uh, Devin. Roland, thank you. And thank you, as always, for providing the space for us to discuss these critical issues together. Uh, April, thank you so much. This work that you're describing is incredible. It's the work of democracy. And of course, it continues the longstanding traditions of unions being on the forefront uh, of building political power, especially for black and brown workers. And uh, as a proud son of Georgia, I especially love what you said, which is that we cannot leave the South behind. Uh, my question for you, though, through your conversations with voters uh, on the ground so far in these battleground states, are there any specific takeaways um, that you've gleaned from these conversations that you believe could be helpful for the Biden-Harris campaign from a strategic standpoint as they seek to build on this work uh, you know, and engaging some of the same voters you've been talking to? Absolutely, Gavin. Thanks for the question. Workers, voters want a hand up. They don't just want a handout. We have seen, particularly since the pandemic, more workers say they are fed up with the status quo. We see numbers of folks talking about unions in the high 70s, right? 50% of folks polled say they want to be in a union themselves. And so we are leaning into this unprecedented 
limited moment of worker power and saying the key to this election is about how are we empowering people, particularly people of color, who today don't necessarily have an easy path to forming a union. That saying they can too build power, they can form their organizations, and they need to elect folks like President Biden and Kamala Harris that have stood with unions, that have stood with workers. Look at their record. It's clear. And we believe that that is a winning strategy that they must lean into. Greg Carr. Thank you, Roland. And thank you, Sister Verrett. Um, and I'm glad that, uh, that we just heard from Gavin about Georgia, in particular bringing up Georgia, given what you all did with Ossoff and Warnick there, mm -hmm. with, with 10 million doors knocked on, just doors, not even calls and texts. I want to ask you about coordination with other groups. Uh, New York Times is reporting that Vote Vets has said they're going to spend $45 million in this election cycle. Future Forward is pledging $250 million in, in advertising, and Move On has said $32 million. How do you coordinate? How does SEIU coordinate with other groups that are going to be involved in this, maybe even non-union groups like the three I just mentioned, to try to make sure that everything is, is effective as you all target specific kind of jobs and roles in, 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 in getting this, this work done? Yeah, you name a table, we want to be at it, right? Of course, we will work with our labor partners. We have a long history of working with public sector unions like AFSCME, the NEA, AFT, other AFL-affiliated um, unions in the private sector. So, you know, building power and working with unions is important, but we don't stop there. Uh, you know, I mentioned before, Black Women's Roundtable is a, is a partner. And we seek to find the groups on the ground in whatever community that we are in, um, from small groups to large groups. But who is getting the work done? Who's out talking to voters? And we want to continue to expand the network of groups that we work with and not be limited, you know, particularly as it comes to reaching younger voters. Um, influencers are, you know, are terribly important in the social media space. So we don't just consider ourselves a, a strictly workers, you know, mobilization effort. We are a voter mobilization effort. So if someone, if there's groups who speak to our values, who share our vision for building worker power, that's who we want to work with. Um, any additional questions for the panel? Um, sure. I have another question. Um, I saw a poll that just came out in Michigan, and it showed that with young people ages 18 to 34, only 28 percent are enthusiastic about Joe Biden, 62 percent are upset with him, um, you know, showing, you know, 28, 62 with, uh, with favorability, unfavorability. Um, what is SE, SEIU's plan to really reach young people um, to get them engaged in this election? I'm seeing everything from being super upset over what's happening on the Hill, like with TikTok, mm -hmm. um, to the issue of Gaza in Michigan. Um, how does SEIU um, turn those low propensity voters into voters going into November? Yeah, look, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. We got a lot of work to do. Um, the, you know, there, we are not necessarily in a good place today, but we started early. We've been on the ground talking to voters, to young voters in Michigan since 2023. Um, we know what we're up against and we have a commitment to not give up, right? We're going to stay there. We're going to stay on the ground. We're going to be there till November. And I think part of what we have to do is look, sure, we'll hit the doors and we'll knock phones and we'll, you know, do the calls. But how do we go to where young people are? We got to find them in their natural habitats where they gather more often, you know, than not nowadays. That's on, you know, social media and virtual spaces. But we also got to go into the communities where young people are and find folks who want to be a part of this with us, right? You find the right young person who's motivated to get their peers out. Like, that's how you begin to build networks amongst young people in communities. And so we will do that, right? Um, I think we also have to be, you know, open and listen. Like, young people can tell us what motivates them, where they need to go, where we need to go, where they want us to be. And so we'll do that. I don't pretend to have all the answers. What I pretend to have is a little bit of money that I'm willing to put behind <laughs> the work and work with people who know more than I know to figure it out. All right, then. So, uh, so we certainly appreciate it. Uh, and I'm also reading, so your, your head of the SEIU is stepping down in May. She, You're running for president? I will be standing to be pres the next international president of our union at our convention in May. 
All right. So they so they vote the convention in May. Yes, sir. And where's it going to be held? The, our convention is in Philadelphia. Okay. All right then. Well, uh, hopefully next time you come back, uh, it'll be uh, President April. Well, have me back. Okay. All right. We'll appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a bunch. Thank you. All right, folks. Uh, Got to go to break. We come back more. We'll be talking to Congresswoman Stacey Plaskett about what is happening in Haiti. Uh, we'll also uh, be having more news of the day. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Support us in what we do. We told you we're fighting a good fight when it comes to these ad agencies and the companies. Uh, Black-owned media gets anywhere from 0.5 to 1% of the $340 billion being spent every year on advertising. Uh, and so your donations are critical. Uh, and our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing on average 50 bucks each. That's $4.19 a month. 13 cents a day. That then raises about a million dollars uh, for us. That goes a long way for us. That offsets our expenses. Uh, of course, you've got this show two hours a day for Roger Muhammad, two hours a day, our uh, weekly shows. We do more original black news content than any other black owned media company uh, in the country. And so, black, what we do, Black Enterprise doesn't do Essence, Ebony, Blavity, The Grio, uh, NNPA. None of them do what we do. So, your support is critical. So, send your Check and money order to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 2003-7-0196. Cash App, Dallas Sound, RM Unfiltered, PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered, Zale, Roland at RolandSMartin.com, Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Uh, be sure to download the Black Start Network app, Apple Phone, Android Phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. We'll be right back. Terry and I... We couldn't play in the white clubs in Minnesota. It felt like such a, um, you know, strength through adversity type mm -hmm. moment that I think black people just have to go through. You know, we have to figure it out. You know, right. we make we make you know lemons out of lemonade. But there's a reason we rented a ballroom, did our own show, promoted it, got like 1,500 people to come out. Clubs were sitting empty. They were like, where's everybody at? And they said, they're down watching a band you wouldn't hire. So it taught us not only that we had to be, we had the talent of musicians, but we also had the, ta had the talent of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like a seat at the table. It's like, no, let's build the table. That's right. We got to build the table. And, That's right. And that was the thing. And of course, after that, we got all kinds of offers. Of course. Right, to come play in the clubs. But we didn't do it. We you said, like, no, we're good. No, we're good. We're good. And that's what put us on a path of national. And of course, when Prince made it, then it was like, okay, we, we see it can be done. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. An angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Bye -bye, Muhammad, live from LA, and this is The Culture. The Culture is a two-way conversation. You and me, we talk about the stories, politics, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. So join our community every day at 3 p.m. Eastern and let your voice be heard. Hey, we're all in this together, so let's talk about it and see what kind of trouble we can get into. It's The Culture, weekdays at 3, only on the Black Star Network. 
What's good, y'all? This is Doug E. Fresh, and you're watching my brother Roland Martin unfiltered as we go a little something like this. Hit it. It's real. Haitian gang leaders are threatening political leaders. Violence has escalated days after Prime Minister Ariel Henry said he would uh, step down once the council was in place. Uh, a fire broke out in the capital, Port-au-Prince, in this main prison. Today, the Senate confirmed uh, Dennis Hankins as the new U.S. ambassador to the Republic of Haiti. Uh, the Congressional Black Caucus has been very much involved in what's going on there. Uh, Congresswoman Stacey Plaskett from the U.S. Virgin Islands is in studio to discuss uh, what in the heck is going on. Glad to have you here. Here with you. So, um, it is... It's like one thing after another. Yeah. One thing after another. Um, yesterday, we had Jacqueline Charles with the Miami, Miami Herald on talking about what's happening there. Mm -hmm. They had the meeting with, with a former sure, sort of presidential council, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. there were like seven or nine different plans that came there. And so for folks who don't know, um, what, what, what is the CBC's involvement with what's taking place in Haiti? Sure. Well, we've been really watching this for some time now, members of the Congressional Black Caucus, requesting from the State Department that they give us briefings, that they give us a plan of what we intend to do as the United States. This is our close neighbor. 11 million people live in Haiti, and many more live here in the United States. Many are, you know, great American citizens, and we need to be concerned. Uh, after the assassination of the prior President Moise, we knew that things were going to spiral out of control, and in fact, they did. The new president, who had never been elected by the people of Haiti, always had his legitimacy questioned. However, there's no legislature, no judiciary. There is nothing in place right now in the country of Haiti. And that has created a vacuum where the gangs have, in fact, gone in place. And they are basically, at this point, running the capital and much of the country. And so while there's an agreement to have uh, Kenyan troops, a 1,000 Kenyan troops to come into the country, the Kenyans are like, look, we can't come into a place that has nobody for us to report to. Hence, members of CARICOM have uh, met in Jamaica to create a provisional government <clears throat> and the idea is that no one in that provisional government would run for office. No one would be individuals that we knew were already bad actors, either having criminal records or been mm -hmm. sanctioned by the UN. The vice president, Kamala Harris, has been very engaged in this, pushing CARICOM, um, meeting with CARICOM, as well as Blinken, who was part of this discussion, to make sure that something is done that we are putting our money in. Um, we as America are putting our money in, not putting troops in, but want to see something happen. And so members of the Black Caucus are also putting pressure on the majority, on the Republicans, um, talking with Greg Meeks, who is now the ranking member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Maxine Waters, uh, with Financial Services, who has been very, always been involved in Haiti. And of course, the chair of the Black Caucus, Stephen Horsford, whose family is from the Caribbean. Um, his mom is Trinidadian descent. We've all been talking and trying to push the Republicans to allow the release of the money. And speaking of that, uh, Democrat leader Hakeem Jeffries, go to my iPad, uh, sent this letter to uh, Speaker Mike Johnson, specifically uh, stating, as he said, the situation on the ground in Haiti has rapidly de deteriorated. Uh, House Republicans have refused to deliver the resources necessary to carry out this mission. Now is the time to release the full $50 million in security support. So, yes. um, so, so, that, so that's being held up. That's being held up. So that means requires the signature of McCall, who is the chair of Foreign Affairs, and Greg Meeks, who's the ranking member. Greg Meeks has been telling us, I've been asking him to release this funding. We need that 40, over 40 million to get these Kenyan troops. Now look, that's not the answer, right? Has Just he given a reason troops. why he hasn't signed off on it? He has hemmed and hawed and not given a reason. But on my fear, is that they are going to be using this, the Republicans, as a political um, impetus to have more migrants coming to the border 
to then say that there's a crisis at the border and, and indeed an even greater crisis at the border. Because we know that people aren't going to stay and continue to face famine, uh, you know, health and, and hunger insecurities that are going on in the country. Then you've got folks like, go to my iPad, uh, NBC News reporter, there's folks like Elon Musk and these other right-wing people uh, are trying to scare people, saying, oh, cannibals are on the loose in Haiti. That's outrageous. Uh, they're, they're saying, oh, uh, plan for, I saw, we played a video yesterday, Congressman Matt Getz, uh, Gates was pressing the Department of Defense, oh, there's, an, there's gonna be an invasion of people exactly. uh, from Haiti kind of coming into the Exactly, that's the kind of language that they wanna use. And they, we know that people, when they are facing these unrests, are going to try and leave. And Haiti is, in fact, very close to Florida, and people will do whatever they can for themselves and their families to be safe. One of those is making that treacherous journey to the United States to try and find safety. Why don't they then instead release the money so that we can provide the support to the Kenyans who want to come, want to be a part? Our vice president, Blinken, are there in meeting with the leaders of the Caribbean nations who know this place better than most and are trying to create a provisional government so that there can be some stability so that we can move to an election, the stabilization of power and moving Haiti in the right direction. But Roland, one of the people that I don't see in this and I keep asking is what about France? While this is part of the United States problem, they're our close neighbor, we, you and I both know that France has extracted enormous millions of dollars from the Haitians over many years. They had an agreement after the revolution that they were supposed to, in fact, be paid for the loss that they were going to receive from not having slaves in Haiti. They have never returned that money, and they need to also be involved in this process at a much more granular level. Um, you and again, as we were talking about uh, what is going on there, the um, and, and not all of a sudden, Fox News cares about Haiti, uh, and so the State Department. Uh, there was a news conference earlier today where they were talking about um, uh, pulling Americans out. So I want to play this for our folks. Listen to this. State Department briefing uh, just a short time ago, our Jillian Turner questioning Matt Miller about whether there are any plans to evacuate Americans who are currently in Haiti and want to get out. Listen to this exchange. No, we are not planning for any, uh, we are not actively planning for any evacuation. And I would remind uh, you and others that Haiti has been a level four country uh, with respect to our travel advisor since 2020. So what that means is for four years, we have been telling Americans, do not go to Haiti. Do not travel there. It's not safe to do so. And for those who are there, leave as soon as you can uh, feasibly do so without putting yourself at risk. So you don't anticipate, or put it this way. So uh, again, I just want people to understand what's going on. If Fox News all of a sudden cares about a black country, we know exactly what we, uh, sure. exactly what their goal is. Sure. Uh, and so him answering that question, because I saw uh, the White House, Simon Atiba posed, oh, uh, Biden is stranding Americans there. That is not the case. That is not uh, the case. There have been numerous warnings about if you go there, you're going on... You're, you're on your own. You're on your own. You're making that decision. Sure. Even members of Congress, we have been begging to be able to go to Haiti. Uh, Greg Meeks, again, Congressman Meeks of New York, tried to go there, was on the ground for an hour, you know, several hours, before he had to be evacuated because the gangs were, in fact, found out that he was there and were coming towards where he was. So Americans, they're only essential workers that the State Department has there on the ground. Um, we know that we need to keep channels for humanitarian aid there, but to say that Americans are stuck with cannibal, uh, Haitian, black folk, that is not the case. And if the Republicans would, again, release the money, let the money go so that the Haitians can do what they need to do to stabilize their own government. Many of them, civic society, former government, business people, want to do what's right by their own country to bring it to peace and bring it to prosperity. And we're standing at the right on the precipice to be able to help or to harm them. And, and the thing that we're dealing with here is, is, is that you don't know who to put your faith behind. Sure, yeah. I mean, it, it is so... I mean, when you saw this... I mean, you've had... Look, they've implicated the, the, uh, the widow of the president who was assassinated. Mm. Uh, his head of security. Uh, and so you, you, now you're sitting here like, okay, well, you know, who do you talk to? Who do you trust? The sure. point about Kenya officials, 
We don't know who to report to. Exactly. I mean, so th that's so then you. I played yesterday. One of the gang leaders, Barbecue, said, mm -hmm. uh, "Hey, Haitian Haitian leaders will be determined by Haiti." Okay, well then, who who is going to be even given the runway to try to repair? The country. Sure, there have been large discussions between civil society um, here in the United States as well as those that are still in Haiti, uh, the Montana group, other organizations that have come together to try and come up with this plan for actors or, you know, groups from, as you said, seven different voting members to observers of various groups to be able to work together to create this provisional um, transitional government. Uh, the, you know, other Caribbean leaders are as well engaged in this. But listen, you know, President, former, now former President Henri was appointed by the uh, president who was assassinated days before his assassination. And now there's even stories that that president that is now uh, stepped down, Henri, received phone calls, made phone calls to some of the masterminds of the assassination. Whether that was happenstance that, you know, six degrees of separation, everybody knows each other, or he was involved, who can say? Uh, we're going to do this. We're going to go to a quick break. We're going to come back. Our panel has questions uh, for Congresswoman Plaskett about what's happening uh, in Haiti. Uh, folks, uh, one of the reasons why you got to support what we do, here's the whole deal. Um, the mainstream media always talks about what's happening in Ukraine and other countries. You do not hear discussions about Haiti or Congo. Uh, and if you do, it's going to be coming from an absolutely uh, place of evil. That's what Fox News is all about. Uh, and so we're having real conversations, trying to get you real information. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, less than 5% of the top executive positions in corporate America are held by women of color. We know it's not because of talent. A recent study says that it's microaggressions, unconscious bias, and limited opportunities being offered to women of color. On our next show, we're gonna get incredible advice from Francine Parham, who's recently written a book sharing exactly what you need to do to make it up into the management ranks and get the earnings that you deserve. I made a point to sit down and I made a point to talk to people. And I made a point to be very purposeful and thought provoking when I spoke to them. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. What's up, everybody? It's your girl, Latasha, from the A. And you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Folks, welcome back to Roland Martin Unfiltered, the Black Star Network. We're chatting with Congresswoman Stacey Plaskett from the U.S. Virgin Islands about what's happening in Haiti. Let's go to my panel for questions. Gavin, you first. All right, thank you, Roland. And thank you, Congresswoman, for joining us to shed some light on the, the tragic situation in Haiti. I think it's particularly tragic and troubling to see this playing out in, you know, our nation, our, in our world's first uh, free black republic, you know, that was born out of the first successful black slave uh, revolt. You know, it's interesting to hear you talk about, you know, some of the paths to peace and prosperity in the short term. But I'm curious, can you uh, share some of your, you know, insights with us as to how we can prevent a situation like this, or perhaps how the people, the leaders of Haiti, can prevent a situation like this from ever happening again? Listen, that's, that's beyond my wisdom on how to do this, how to not prevent this. Of course, there are textbooks that explain how this should and should not work. And I think the history of Haiti is one of such division throughout its, from its revolution to its independence that we've got to peel so many layers back in terms of the, uh, you know, the real systemic attempt to ensure that Haiti never prospered uh, in the first place that is causing it to be where it is now. I talk to Haitian leaders. We have a, we're, I'm so blessed that we have a, a Haitian member of Congress, uh, Sheila Sherfulis McCormick, 
whose family is from Haiti, represents the uh, Florida, but represents Haitian people as well, to talk about the needs at multiple levels, right? We don't just need militaries to support them in military or even in elections, but how do we support their school systems, health issues? Uh, and that needs to be multi-layered and it needs to be Haitian-led. There are some enormously great civil civic societies members that I've been talking with and that are really engaged in this. And I think we just gotta listen to them and give them the support that they need. They've come together in an incredible fashion. You know, it's hard for black folks to sit down and agree on anything. Uh, it's hard for anybody to agree on anything, but they have uh, done the tough work, and I think it's just for us to take their lead. Rebecca? Thank you, Congresswoman, for being on the show tonight. Sure. So we know or we've heard reports that over 500,000 um, illegal guns are flowing through Haiti and primarily coming from the United States. There's even an Episcopalian um, church that is that, that has been reported to be a part of um, this arms trafficking. We also know since um, the earthquake in 2010, Billions and billions of dollars was raised for Haiti, and many of those dollars did not actually um, flow to the ground. So my question for you is, who do you think benefits um, if from a, um, um, a Haiti that's not stable? I think there are so many people that don't benefit. And most of it is, of course, as you discuss, economic in nature individuals who are grabbing for power for their own pecuniary gain. Um, in the last summer, we saw, and you know, when you talk about guns, that's something that's going on throughout the Caribbean. And a lot of it is related to drug trafficking. Guns are not manufactured in the Caribbean basin, but they sure enough are everywhere. And the Caribbean leaders spoke with uh, the vice president, as well as with the State Department, and the vice president has rolled out initiatives that are going to be about how do we stop gun trafficking going into the Caribbean basin, uh, which is part of an anti-drug initiative. Individuals who were part of the leader of the gangs, one of the leaders of the gangs, just got out of jail last year in the United States for drug uh, money laundering and doing drug money laundering. So we know that drugs and guns, as well as um, death, is it's the same way even in our inner cities, right? We know that where you see those things, you also see people profiting monetarily, and that's what's happening in Haiti as well. Greg? Uh, thank you, Roland, and, and thank you, Congresswoman Plaskett. I also want to denote that this is a very difficult thing, I'm sure, for members of the CBC, particularly since Joe Biden deported a bunch of Haitians early on in his, in his administration. My question is, is related to Rebecca's, and it really, how do... How does the Congressional Black Caucus see its role, particularly in this in this difficult election season, in pushing the Biden administration around this issue of making sure this isn't a continuance of American foreign interference in Haiti as opposed to international support? Uh, the, the Mexican uh, Secretary of Foreign Affairs was in Jamaica, as you say, as they're trying to put together this 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 meeting and, and work with Haiti and she said you know we got to ensure that all actors at the table we know as you've mentioned Jimmy uh, Chirizier uh, that they call barbecue but one time he was the U.S.'s man then they lock him up and then Guy Philippe has showed up again we know he was on the dole too for the United States at the time H how does the con how can the Congressional Black Caucus stake out a position that certainly supports the Haitian people, and uh, you say keep the money going. Now, we know, of course, that Kenya was only reached out to because nobody in the core group, Brazil, Canada, France, wanted to lead the, 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 the invasion or the, the occupation. How can the CBC push out, push the Biden administration in this election year, realizing the difficult calculus of this being interjected in U.S. politics, but at the same time just making sure the U.S. doesn't continue its policy of foreign intervention as opposed to international support? Well, I think what you're seeing is that the United States is looking to what are the Haitian people saying that they need. Um, that's why we don't have troops on the ground there. We only have a very small um, Marine group that are looking at our embassy because we still need to keep 
essential workers there on the ground. And we don't want to be seen as intervention. And when you talk about people that the United States have supported that have turned out to be bad actors, these were people that Haitians supported that turned out to be bad actors. These are people that other Caribbean leaders said were going to be good actors. So I don't want it to appear that, you know, the United States are the only ones that are funneling support into people who turn out to not be correct. But I think as the Black Caucus, what we have been doing is constantly pushing the State Department in terms of what is your policy and what are we hearing from our constituency that tells us that your policy may not be correct. That was what we did with regard to Ariel Henry, who uh, the State Department and the Biden administration initially were supportive of. And then many of our members in New York and Florida and Massachusetts, other places were saying, hey, our constituents, our Haitian constituents are telling us this is not the man and that you need to back up from that. You know that Daniel Foote was a special envoy for a while. His resignation was not just about the deportation, but his resignation was also his frustration over the State Department continuing to support Ariel Henry. And so we, as the Black Caucus, are trying to listen to the voices of Black America and its diaspora, which includes Haitians, Caribbean people, others who are hearing from their friends and family back home as to what is working and what's not working and trying to keep everybody honest brokers in this. But I have to say that at this time, you know, America is for a little longest, Canada was saying that they were going to come in, they were going to support, they have the language skills, and then they decided, no, we've got cold feet, we don't want to be involved in this. And so who do you bring in to support and bring order when you do not have police officers? Police officers in Haiti had not been paid in almost a year. Many of them then turned to be gang members or leaders of gangs. We don't have a, a parliament. We don't have a, a ministry of justice there. There are not elected leaders. And so we are looking, in fact, to civil society to be the ones telling us where is the right place and, and how do we move forward. All right, then. Congresswoman Plaskett, always a pleasure to have you. We appreciate Thank you. It. Thanks, Thanks so, much. so much. All right, folks. Uh, we'll be right back right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Talking about the case out of Mississippi where a cop has been accused of forcing an inmate to lick urine off the floor. That's Mississippi in 2024. Back in a moment. I'm Faraji Muhammad, live from LA. And this is The Culture. The Culture is a two-way conversation. You and me, we talk about the stories, politics, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. So join our community every day at 3 p.m. Eastern and let your voice be heard. Hey. We're all in this together, so let's talk about it and see what kind of trouble we can get into. It's the culture, weekdays at 3, only on the Black Star Network. Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr. Democracy in the United States is under siege. On this list of bad actors, it's easy to point out the Donald Trumps, the Marjorie Taylor Greens, or even the United States Supreme Court as the primary villains. But as David Pepper, author, scholar, and former politician himself says, there's another factor that trumps them all and resides much closer to many of our homes. His book is Laboratories of Autocracy, a wake-up call from behind the lines. So these state houses get hijacked by the far right, then they gerrymander, they suppress the opposition, and that allows them to legislate in a way that doesn't reflect the people of that state. David Pepper joins us on the next Black Table here on the Black Star Network. Hey, I'm Donnie Simpson. Yo, it's your man Dion Cole from Blackish, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered.
All right, folks, welcome back to Rolla Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. A Florida police officer is no longer facing aggravated battery charges for shooting an unarmed man in 2020. Orange County Deputy Sheriff Bruce Stoke uh, was awaiting trial since the then state attorney, Monique Laurel, presented the grand jury with evidence supporting the charges of shooting um, uh, Edelson uh, Urbina. Hmm, quite interesting here. Uh, he, uh, investigators say, say Stoke pulled the trigger because he was in fear of his life, although it turned out that Urbina had no weapon. Um, we're going to be talking with the uh, former state's attorney uh, about this story uh, because uh, it is uh, quite a, a strange story, if you will, uh, in just a second. Uh, now, here's what happened. The DeSantis-appointed uh, state's attorney, Andrew Bain, uh, he then accuses Monique Worrell of ethical violations for pursuing the case. Okay, that makes no sense there. Now, if you want to understand what's happening in Florida, what's happening in Florida uh, is that Ron DeSantis has been uh, constantly targeting, he's been targeting uh, state's attorneys who do not agree with him. So, uh, is this video of the shooting here? All right, roll it. sound of this just keep rolling in so uh again folks uh now here we go stop 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 running stop running stop running get on the ground get on the ground show your head show your fucking head stalk you okay stalk Hey, so give me a light. I need a light. Keep your fucking hands up. We're in the middle. Just come to the uh, east of the Bravo, east of the Bravo. Now, again, Urbina was shot in the leg as he ran away from a traffic stop. Uh, Stoke told investigators he pulled the trigger because he was in fear for his life, but Urbina didn't have a gun. So now you have uh, the descendants appointed Orange County uh, Osceola State Attorney Andrew Bain now trying to criticize his predecessor for, quote, ethical violations in pursuing the case. Joining us right now is Bonique Worrell and Andrew Darling, uh, Urbina's attorney, both from Orlando. Um, first, Monique, ethical violations? I, I'm, I'm, I'm confused. How, how do you have ethical violations in pursuing a case against a cop who shot somebody. I'm confused. Another important point is that there are ethical violations where there is a confession from an officer who shot someone. So he confessed to it, and now we know Urbina did not have a weapon. So how in the hell is ethical violations with you? Because this is political. It's not about truth. It's not about justice. The reality is, in a transition of power... ...to be able to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's something that's perfectly reasonable, and it's something that, you know, happens. But because this is political, because this is about taking me out, assassinating my character, and making the voters of Orange and Osceola County lose faith in me, what they decided to do instead was write a 30-page report telling everyone that the reason they can't go forward on this case is because I was unethical to bring these charges to begin with. What they're telling people is, don't believe your lying ears when this officer told you that he intentionally shot this unarmed man, that he was not being truthful, and the state attorney should have known that he was not being truthful and should never have brought charges against him. So, um, Andrew Darling, so uh, your client gets no justice uh, in this case. No, and, and keep in mind, my client turned 18 years old a month before he was shot. 
he was shot in the leg. And in the video that you showed, his hands are already above his head. His hands were above his head the entire time. There was never a point where they were not above his head. He gave multiple sworn statements, my client did, to the state attorney's office to cooperate with the investigation. This officer, this deputy clearly said, I intended to shoot him that night. He clearly said a month later, I intended to shoot him. And the state attorney wants you to believe, oh no, I didn't actually, the officer didn't actually intend to shoot him. So from your perspective, uh, do you see this as Bain protecting law enforcement? 100%. On August 9th, when Monique Worrell was removed, I, my law firm sent out a tweet. And I said, if the case against Bruce Stoke for shooting an unarmed man in 2020 is dismissed, we know 100% it's a political decision. This was August of last year that I tweeted that out from my law firm Twitter at Darling Law. At that point, I knew that's what it was. They had a solution and they went looking for a problem. The solution was dismiss the case against law enforcement officer. And here are these you know, experienced prosecutors. Let's go find a problem with the prosecution so we can justify getting rid of it. So Monique, do you believe uh, that this is a deliberate attempt uh, to, for them to say that you are incompetent and not doing your job fairly? Absolutely. And the irony here is that if we look back to the executive order of my removal, they talked about how I under prosecuted cases. And now here is a case that I prosecuted and they're saying that I shouldn't have prosecuted. So what it shows is the severe contradiction in what they're saying and the fact that none of this is based on fact. The reality is, under my administration, because I made a promise to the people of Orange and Osceola counties that we would hold law enforcement accountable when they broke the law, I created a team that was focused on officer-involved critical incidents. And that team reviewed dozens of cases. And out of those dozens of cases, there were dozens of cases that were not prosecuted. Whether or not I liked what happened in the case, we didn't move forward with prosecution because I knew that I could not prove those cases beyond a reasonable doubt. There were cases where there was public pressure, where I lost supporters, and I knew that there would be political pressure for me to prosecute those cases. And I did not because ethically, I understood my obligation to the law and to the community, and it was not to push cases forward that I could not prove beyond a reasonable doubt. This case was different. This case had a confession. And as someone who practiced criminal law for 20 years, I have never in the history of my practice seen a prosecutor's office disregard the confession of a defendant. And the reason that's important is because it shows and illustrates the double standard that's being used by which we review confessions made by law enforcement. This law enforcement officer said in no uncertain terms, in two separate statements, that he intentionally shot this unarmed individual. There is absolutely no justification for disbelieving his testimony. That was his statement. That is the evidence in the case. So um, you really have no place to go, Andrew, I guess, except other than a civil lawsuit. Yes, sir. So in the state of Florida, when you are preparing to sue a municipality or a government entity, you have to file what's called a notice of claim uh, and then wait six months before you can do anything. So we did that more than a year ago. Uh, we are in the process now of determining what the best avenue is, whether that's going to be some sort of settlement with the sheriff's office and the Florida Sheriff's Association, whether that's going to be a state lawsuit or whether that's going to be a federal lawsuit. We're going to explore every avenue, and we are ready to get the only kind of justice that my client is going to get in this case, which is hopefully monetary. All right, then. Uh, Monique, any final comments? You know, Roland, we're seeing this type of thing happen all across the country, where People who want to bring community justice by holding law enforcement officers accountable are being vilified and removed to show us that law enforcement is above the law. And this is a serious issue. It's something that the community needs to pay attention to and the elected officials and the people who are in the seat, because in order for us to bring trust in the legal process from the community, 
we're going to have to show that law enforcement does not control the decisions of state attorney's offices and that state attorney's offices and district attorney's offices can act independently of pressure from law enforcement. All right, then. All right, then. We appreciate both of you joining us. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you for your time. For having me. This also goes to, uh, Greg, what happens when a fascist is elected uh, governor of Florida who then wants to become president uh, and uh, that's all Ron DeSantis is. Absolutely. A failed candidate, a failed politician, a punk who shouldn't be the governor of Florida. If Brother, DeSan uh, Brother uh, Andrew Gillum had not conceded so quickly, might not be the governor of Florida if they had kept counting votes. But we know the Supreme Court had knows what to do in those situations. See Bush v. Gore, stop in and tell him stop counting the votes. But either way, this punk has failed. And he's back in Florida, and he's continuing his work. This hunter, we saw, we all saw the video. This is another one of those punk hunters with his manhood in his hands, uh, emptying his clip at this innocent guy. I mean, you know, you heard the shouting, the screaming, the cursing. This is their, this is the hunting playbook. And what they're doing to, to many, well, as, as you as you framed it, Roland, this is their strategy in Florida. And it's not just Florida, of course, because these, these Klansmen meet, and they meet nationwide, and then they roll out their playbook at the state level. Take away local control. Switch out the prosecutors you don't like. Make an example of these Negroes. And this, in this case, this, these racists are after Monique Worrell. So yeah, there'll probably be a settlement, there'll be a check, but ultimately their objective, which is to terrorize black people, will remain in place. And the next hunter will go unimpeded to shoot at us until, quite frankly, uh, something happens that stops them. Gavin? Yeah, I think, as Greg said, right, this is part of the, you know, MAGA Republicans nationwide uh, blueprint. This is not just isolated to Florida. I mean, as I was watching that tape, I was feeling deja vu to so many other instances in which we've seen this play out. And, you know, Republicans claim to be all about local control, right? And, you know, for someone like, you know, Monique, who just joined us, theoretically, Republicans should want her to, you know, run the case as she sees fit, given she's closer, you know, to the, to the issues that matter most to the uh, constituents who elected her to hold office. But of course, it's all about hypocrisy. It's all about white supremacy. It's all about control. Um, but I want to just uh, emphasize what Greg said, which is that this is not happening in a vacuum. It's not happening in isolation. And it's to remind all of us, right, in 2024, you know, as we're hyper fixated on the presidential election, let's also not just this year, but every year, remember the importance of state elections when it comes to our governor, when it comes to, you know, uh, members of the state legislature and other elected positions. And, you know, when it comes to those who are then going to appoint positions that we might not vote for, the, but the people we vote for will be appointing them, we have to be awake as to what's going on. Um, otherwise, instances like these, uh, because of the racism that pervades, you know, our police departments across the country will continue to happen unchecked. Rebecca? You know what? I'm with Dr. Carr here. I can't believe we're letting a pompous fascist who wears moon boots terrorize the entire state. I mean, this guy is crazy, and he's making Florida, um, you know, he's making the outcomes in Florida um, become e even much worse. You know, I think about my um, trans godchild in Florida, um, who's in high school now, and having to deal with constant threats about their sexual identity and how they present themselves. It's literally terror that our young people in Florida and our communities of color and black communities in Florida are undergoing because it is a, a awful governor. But you know what? I have a challenge here. So, you know, being an organizer, here's my call to action. We see Disney. We see that Disney's fighting back, but I need Disney to do more. Uh, I need Disney to help reconfigure what that state house looks like in Florida. And they could do that by funding candidates who will not go along with the fascist regime that we currently see in Florida. So I need these corporations who are upset to actually do something about it and put their money behind candidates who, who are pro-democracy and not pro-fascism. All right, folks, hold tight one second. Uh, we come back. Um, this black Texas Republican, Wesley Hunt, out of Texas. I, I don't understand a lot of these black Republicans who literally have never read a book. Uh, wait till you, we play for y'all this video where he's talking about uh, voting rights in this country. <sighs> Back in a moment. 
need you to scream for your new beginning. Five, four, three, two. I'm Faraji Muhammad, live from LA, and this is The Culture. The Culture is a two-way conversation. You and me, we talk about the stories, politics, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. So join our community every day at 3 p.m. Eastern and let your voice be heard. Hey, we're all in this together, so let's talk about it and see what kind of trouble we can get into. It's The Culture, weekdays at 3, only on the Black Star Network. What's up, y'all? This is Wendell Haskins, a.k.a. Win Hogan at the Original Tee Golf Classic. And you know I watch Roland Martin Unfiltered. So, Texas Republican uh, Wesley Hunt, not too happy with the John Lewis Voting Act. He actually goes... Oh, voting is not hard. It's fairly easy. So he speaks before Congress, and if y'all want a good laugh, just listen to this black Republican. Thank you, Chairman Durbin and Ranking Member Graham for having me here today to speak about voting rights in America, the country that I love dearly. More importantly, I'm here to talk about the left's soft bigotry of low expectations. Because it's the Democrat Party, not the Republican Party, that thinks so little of black America as the people of color that they make the case that being black in America means we can't obtain a government ID to vote. And that's not only a ridiculous assertion, it's demeaning and it's insulting. When it comes down to it, many of my colleagues on the left like to pretend that we're still living in the 1950s. Well, we're not. I've got some good news for you. It's 2024, and I know what year it is because I've been black for just over 40 years. And I'm also the son of a retired lieutenant colonel who grew up in a segregated South. You see, my parents grew up in a Jim Crow South in the 50s and 60s in New Orleans, Louisiana. Their next generation, my parents had three kids. My sister, brother, and I all went to West Point, all three of us. We all served our country in combat. And I sit before you today as a sitting United States congressman in a district in a suburb of Houston, Texas, that's a white majority district, that President Trump would have won by 25 points and I won by almost 30 points. And that doesn't happen unless we've made some incredible progress in this great nation. Now, my colleagues on the left like to say that common sense voting laws, including requiring a government-issued ID, are racist, and discriminatory, and burdensome. Do you know what my father had back in the 40s and 50s before it was even cool? A government issue. ID. And continuing in his footsteps, I too have multiple government issued IDs. And while that might be shocking to many people in this country, people may ask, how's that happen? It's very simple. It's personal responsibility for all Americans in this country, regardless of what you look like. Sitting with me today is my global entry card, my military ID card, my Texas driver's license. My Texas license to carry, because that's how we roll in Texas. My congressional card. And of course, the good old fashioned American passport. What sorcery is this? What am I, the, the, the black Houdini? How was I able to pull off the impossible and attain not one, not two, not three, but six government issue IDs? Personal responsibility in this country. I fought for this country as an Apache helicopter pilot to protect free and fair elections. And having a government-issued ID isn't racist, it's American. 
need to have an ID to drive a car, to check into the airport, open a bank account. You need an ID for basically everything to be a responsible adult in this country, except for voting, apparently, according to the left. Black America does not need well-meaning liberals putting their arms around us to telling us how we should go to the polls. In fact, if you look at recent headlines and polls, you will find that black men specifically in this country are more fired up than ever to participate in the next presidential election. And I think I know why, and I'm really looking forward to these results. For the record, in, 20, in the 2022 midterms in Georgia, it proved that election integrity and ballot accessibility can be achieved hand in hand. After the 2020 election, Georgia passed a voter election integrity law, and subsequently, the Department of Justice filed a lawsuit against the state of Georgia, alleging that the Georgia law is discriminatory and aims to restrict citizens from voting. President Biden even called this law, called this law and I quote, Jim Crow 2.0. Really? In my humble opinion, referencing Jim Crow for common sense election integrity laws is offensive to those who actually experienced Jim Crow, like my parents and their parents before them. In fact, the law wasn't discriminatory at all because in the 2022 midterms, Georgia voters shattered voter turnout records across the state. And despite that record-breaking turnout in Georgia, the DOJ lawsuit is still pending. I suspect that it's because that record-breaking turnout. All right, I, I couldn't hear enough of that bullshit any longer uh, from uh, Wesley Hunt. So let me explain. To, let me explain to you. So m maybe Wesley will understand this better uh, if I put this on, uh, because he wants to sit here and talk about his parents and him being from Texas and him being from a suburb of Sugar Land that's a majority white district that I almost won by uh, 30,000 points, and uh, I've got uh, six voter IDs. And y'all notice he kept talking about personal responsibility. If people just have some uh, personal responsibility. And so that's really the problem. And these liberals saying that black people, uh, they, 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 they can't get a voter ID. See, see that's the language they all always use. Go to my iPad. New analysis, folks, this was last year. Millions of Americans lack forms of ID that are increasingly required to vote. What you will not hear from the Wesleys of the world is that, hmm, key finding in the analysis. As of 2020, nearly 29 million voting age U.S. citizens did not have a non-expired driver's license, and over 7 million did not have any other form of non-expired government-issued voter ID. It says in states with strict voter identification laws, including Georgia, Indiana, Kansas, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Wisconsin, over 3 million voting age U.S. citizens did not have a current driver's license, and over a million did not have any non-expired government license. Oh, it says right here, more than 11 million young people did not have a current driver's license, and more than 3 million did not have any unexpired government license. ID. Now, keep reading. 18, 19 year olds. You see them talking about uh, their ability uh, to be able to vote. Then you see uh, right there as they continue to talk about uh, the numbers there, the underrepresented groups. It says that uh, uh, an estimated 1.86 million black and non Hispanic Americans, 1.86 million Hispanic Americans lack a photo ID. 4.5% of those who identify as Native American. Uh, this compares to just 2.3% of white, non-Hispanic, and 1.6% of Asian. You hear, keep it on there. You heard, you heard Wesley Bell talk about, oh, you got to have an ID to open a bank account. Well, the reality is it's a lot of people in America who don't have bank accounts. Then you see it says right here, the analysis found a strong relationship between income and lack of a driver's license with adult Americans earning less than $30,000 lacking a driver's license at a rate about five times greater 
being the highest income category of 100,000 or more. So let me go ahead and put it to you like this. The sheer arrogance of a Wesley Hunt is he wants to sit here and go, oh, I have this ID and this ID and I got a passport. Hey, Wesley, since you want to be a smart ass, why don't you tell people how much a passport cost? Oh, that could be it. Hey, Wesley, why don't you tell, how, tell people how the laws are written, such as in Ohio, when they required birth certificates in order for you to get the ID, and the birth certificate had to be a certain paperweight? Do you want to talk about how many older voters who could not vote because when they were born, in Jim Crow hospitals, since you want to bring up Biden and Jim Crow, how they couldn't access their birth records. So therefore, and remember, oh, by the way, Wesley, since Yola asked from Texas, there are two types of birth certificates. There's the original birth certificate, and there's a birth certificate from the v Bureau of Vital Statistics. Some states actually required the original birth certificate, the one where they used to have the two feet uh, uh, on the actual birth certificate, and they would actually specify in some of the laws how the seal needed to be raised. And then they would say that a certificate from the Bureau of Vital Statistics, Bureau of Vital Statistics, that wasn't applicable. Oh, I noticed how you skipped over all of that. I noticed how you skipped over when Pennsylvania passed their voter ID law, how they then said that in order for you to, if you did not have an ID, you had to then go to the center, appear in person, fill out an affidavit, go back home, apply for your voter ID, and then when it came in, you had to come in and pick it up. Oh, Wesley. What about the people who, who have no car, who use public transportation? Now you're requiring them to spend money on transportation to go pick the ID up. For everybody who's watching, I just need y'all to understand, this is how these trifling Republicans want to pimp us, and then they use blackface to sit here and oh, talk about my history and my parents and who grew up in Jim Crow and I did this here and I served my country and me and three of my siblings, we all went to West Point. Oh, we're just good old Americans. And the problem is you can't get no voter ID. It's because you don't have any personal responsibility. You just lazy. You can't get out there and spend the money to go get your passport. Well, why in the hell do you need a passport if your ass can't afford to leave the country? See, the arrogance of people like Congressman Wesley Hunt is they don't want to accept the reality that everybody's not like the rest of us. I've had this conversation with some other black people. Bro, I don't understand what's the problem. I'm like, oh, so your college educated ass, you were sitting here saying, well, I have this and I have that. Why can't they? Since I go ahead, so I went ahead and brought up college educated, you saw Wesley Hunt sit there and pull out his right to carry card and his that. Oh, Wesley, did you also forget that in your state of Texas, in my home state, that if you are a student at Texas Southern University, you probably ain't never even walked on that campus, or at Texas A&M, or Texas Tech, or Sam Houston State, or North Texas or any state institution, that's a state ID. Oh, I'm sorry, in Texas, you can't use your government state ID from your state college because your fellow Republicans ban them. Oh, but you can use your gun permit. You can use your gun ID, but you can't use your state ID. We know what the games are. And so you sat there for six minutes and said a whole bunch of nothing. And all you are down with are denying people the opportunity. And here's the other thing that's so crazy. I filled up my voter registration card many times, had it certified. They mailed it back to me. It used to be I could just come in with my voter registration card. 
had my name, had my address, had everything on it. They looked down, here it is, go vote. But no. And I also noticed, Wesley, you didn't bring up the more than 1,000 voting locations that were shut down after Shelby V. Holder. I noticed you didn't talk about how voting locations in Mississippi were being changed the night before the election, so on election day, folk didn't know where to vote. I noticed you ain't discussed any of those things in your little tirade about personal responsibility when it come to getting your voter ID and how the left, they out here saying that black people, we not smart enough to get us a voter ID. Hmm. I noticed how you also didn't say nothing, how uh, they uh, changed the rules in the Dakotas that impacted Native Americans being able to vote on their reservation. Oh, you, I, I got it. You had six minutes of testimony and you didn't have enough time to cover all of those things. I understand. You were too busy giving us the history of your black family growing up in Jim Crow America. Rebecca. You know, I could be petty and talk about how corny he sounded. I could be petty to talk and say that sound like he was talking through his teeth, but I'll bite. <laughs> I'll actually, you know, talk to the substance. The issue with people like Wesley is that he completely ignores the math. We all know ever since the Shelby decision, um, we we know ever you know since 2013 that the racial turnout gap has steadily increased, and it's not because oh black people are apathetic and don't want to vote. That's not it, because black folks are the most rationally and informed voting block in this country. That that's the first thing. But the reason why um, that gap has increased. The racial um, um, turnout gap has increased is because the very jurisdictions, the very cities and towns that used to have to, that used to um, have to get pre-clearance from the Justice Department before they changed their local rules, um, and they had to do that because they were trying to keep black folks from being able to vote. Those same counties, those same areas, are their racial turnout gap is twice the rate as the racial turnout gap anywhere else in the country. So we know that there is an intentional anti-black racist attack on black voters to ensure that those who support white supremacy in this country, those who are anti-democratic in this country stay in power. We know that that's the numbers. And just to give a tangible impact, we know in 2022, there were 14 million black voters missing. If Shelby didn't happen, if the Arkansas case didn't happen, then we know that there would have been probably another 14 million black voters um, who would have been likely to turn out to vote in 2022. So we know that this is a systemic, targeted issue. But finally, the final thing I'll say about Wesley, I'm always suspicious about black people who want to be to be the token black person in a sea of white faces. And that's what Wesley is. At the end of the day, Wesley, you act as if you speak on behalf of Black America, but guess what? You don't. You don't even represent a um, congressional district that have many um, African Americans in your congressional district. So you speak for those white folks there, for those folks who don't want Black people to be able to vote. That's who you speak for. So own it. Instead of trying to, you know, showboat in Congress as if you are a WWE WrestleMania announcer, just say what it is. You look down on other Black people. So. I'll always be suspicious of people like you who want to rise above blackness when I think being black is something to celebrate. I, I noticed, Gavin, that Wesley did not talk about, go to my iPad, he didn't talk about this case. Folks might remember uh, the black man who waited in line for six hours at Texas Southern University just to cast his ballot. Uh, he was photographed, a video was taken. That man was thrown into a two-year legal limbo because a Republican lawyer saw him on television. Uh, and this right here uh, was it right here, the last of the voting line at TSU. This is March 2020. Some people waited for six hours. He was the last person in line. So it was talked about. Well, guess what? Then that pathetic uh, indicted thug, Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton, indicted this brother 
uh, on two counts of illegal voting, held him on a $100,000 bond. And so he was on parole. He spent two years in legal limbo. Uh, a DA, a district judge in Montgomery County dismissed the case. Then the attorney general's office refiled the charges, this time in Harris County. And the matter finally came to a close when a grand jury determined last summer that no crime had occurred. And so, guess what? This brother who was committed, this brother who wanted to exercise his power, this is what he says. He's not going to vote again. I know I'm not. I mean, I care. He's no longer on parole and is eligible to vote. He goes, I mean, I care. But if I had to go through all of that just to vote, no. What happened in Florida last year when they arrested several uh, black and Hispanic and some white folks uh, accusing them of voting illegally? Well, guess what? The judges threw out all those particular cases, but that wasn't the point. The point was to serve as a chilling effect and to say, mm -hmm. if you ever serve time in prison, this might be you. That's why they're still going after Crystal Mason seven years after the fact. This is what Republicans do, but I know this uh, uh, Congressman Wesley Hunt, he didn't bring up none of this. Well, Roland, you know what else he didn't bring up? He didn't bring up the fact that Republicans in my home state of Georgia passed Senate Bill 202 after the election of 2020, which now makes it a crime to give food and water to people like, like that gentleman there in Texas who may have been waiting in line for six hours or longer. And like you said, they've been closing down polling stations and all of that. So, of course, Representative Hunt didn't mention any of that. He said it's not the 1950s anymore, it's 2024. That's the point. It's 2024, and we're still trying to make it harder to vote. I'm not sure how much he and, and Ben Carson and, and Byron Donalds and Tim Scott are getting paid for all this, but it's sad. And it's not because I think all black people have to think the same way. But when it comes to issues like voting rights, I guess to me, it's just pretty simple. You either want to make it easier to vote or you want to make it harder to vote. You either think that the right to vote ought to be expanded or it ought to be contracted. And it would be one thing if, you know, there was some evidence that there's voter fraud. We know that those are lies. That couldn't be further from the truth. But Congressman Hunt, by talking about the results of his election and all that, he said the quiet part out loud. He made it clear that this is all about power. Republicans are scared that they're going to get beat. So they know they got to rig the rules of the game. And we can trace all of this back. We talked about Shelby County in 2013. But this can all be traced back. These modern attempts to suppress the black vote can be traced back to the election of Barack Obama. And we know it's been an open season on voting rights since then, of course, in 2013. And I can say, going back to being a Georgia voter, that I've experienced the effects of SB 202. It's now harder for me to vote by mail. There are more steps that I have to take. When I was voting in the primaries just last week, I got a call from the voting office saying that they mailed me the wrong ballot and they were going to cancel it. I have no idea what is going on. And this is for someone like me, who's relatively privileged and politically engaged. So think about what that means for so many other voters. The last thing I'll say, you know, he tried to make it seem like, oh, we got all these people voting, you know, th these, these rules aren't, these new laws aren't, aren't really being a barrier to black voters. We might have more black people voting, but that's not because of anything he has to say. That's because of the sheer will and determination of the voters in our community. It's a testament to the magnificence of Stacey Abrams, and it's a testament to the dedication and the hard work of people like Rebecca, who just spoke before me. So. That's what I gotta say, Roland. You know, uh, uh, Greg uh, Wesley Clark, Wesley Hunt posted this on his little Facebook page. Uh, go to my iPad. You know, Emily and I are honored to exercise <laughs> our right to vote. Uh, hashtag I voted. Yeah, yeah, you and Emily voted, uh, but y'all sure as hell don't mind stopping a lot of black and brown folk and poor white folk and young voters from voting. We know that you have on record, you have on record where a clerk in Wisconsin uh, in 2020 says she moved an early voting location off of a college campus because too many white, young white kids are voting Democrat. And they moved it to a location further out with a small parking lot. See, these are the games Republicans play. They, they don't want to make it easier to vote. They love talking about the troops. And you heard Wesley sitting there talking about, oh, I, I served my country, and me and my family, we served our country in the military. Oh, but they want to make it harder. They want to get rid of ballot drop boxes. They want to cut early voting locations. They want to rig elections and steal them so they can win because they are actually on record. Uh, the former Georgia Speaker of the House who died last year uh, said, 
if we pass all these voting laws, we will never win another election. They know it. They've said it. If you expand the opportunities for Americans to vote, Republicans say we will never win because they don't want to win on policy. They want to win by cheating. Absolutely. And they call that election integrity. Anytime you hear the white nationalists refer to election integrity, what they mean is voter suppression. Um, you know, I appreciate you, Rebecca. You took the high road. Uh, I'm not going to take the high road because uh, I have an example in Roland S. Martin, who just showed that man's wife and and uh, goaded me into mentioning that. I mean, they, they got this man out of central casting. There seems to be something, there seems to be a batch of these Negroes with the crushed larynxes, uh, maybe it's their esophagus, I'm not sure, maybe it's the trachea, uh, that allows them to talk like that and say, you know, back in the 40s and 50s. I mean, what, what is this this ragged projection? The, 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 your whole throat is constricted, trying to prove to white people. This is the Negro who, having pulled out his 50th or 60th ID when he's that away in handcuffs, is still trying to convince these people that he's on their side because he just can't believe that somehow all of his loyalty won't be rewarded one day in heaven. I mean, he's already gotten an earlier prize, but, uh, but, but yeah, the, to the point, I mean, and I appreciate, uh, again, what you said, brother. Um, we just uh, lost this week the great Dory Ladner, a great civil rights warrior and titan out of Hattiesburg, Mississippi. She and her sister Joyce, a uh, member of Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, a sister who headed up the local office of the Council of Federated Organization. Uh, of course, was there when they had the bombing of 16th Street Baptist Church, the funeral for three of the four girls who were killed that day in September 1963, and then followed that up by being at the center of Freedom Summer. And Dory Ladner said, I was born to rebel. I was born to fight. We have to understand that uh, these people cannot be reasoned with because it isn't about laying out facts. They know the facts. But as you say, Roland, they just want to win. So when you get a crushed Larnix Negro like that, a Negro who was in the House of Representatives, shout out to the Texas uh, 38th for sending your mascot to the federal legislature. When you see him testify as he did before the Judiciary Committee's uh, subcommittee having the uh, committee having the hearing on the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, no doubt that little Lynn Graham, who was is the ranking member of the Senate on that committee, reached out to the other side and said, mascot, Come here, because we got little Timmy over here in South Carolina, but we need you to come in here and talk about going to the polls and pulling out your six or seven IDs. But here's the little memo, son. Let's be very clear. The ID that counts the most in this country is the ID you came out of your black mother's womb with. And no piece of paper, no ability to uh, chuckle your voice and show up with your wife and say that you all respect my None of that's going to save you. One other thing I'll say, as you know, Roland, because they, they live in the neighborhood with your family, you know, my, my sister and brother-in-law, my niece and nephew live in Texas. And I got a lot of good friends in Texas. And when they take their teenage children to go get driver's licenses and learner's permits, they have found now that you have to make an appointment. And they take maybe five walk-ins a day to get a driver's yeah. license. And in Texas, you can wait as long as three damn months to anybody with a teenage child in Texas. Go ahead, Roland, because you know about. Oh no, 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 no! I just had to. I just had to. Um, I my my driver's license expired uh, before my birthday, and I I literally had no idea. So I I called. I, I told my parents I was flying in, and they said, "Hey, why don't you go to the driver's license location in Midlothian, uh, in uh." uh south of Dallas, because it's small, not a lot of traffic. All right, so I go in. Now, mind you, I got a driver's license. I'm just getting it renewed. I go, I go in. They go, oh, no, no, we still have the COVID rules in place. You have to make an appointment. I go, excuse me? I have to make an appointment. Oh, yeah, it's, it's on the website. So I'm like... Look, I'm only in town. I literally only flew in town to get it renewed. So, um, and, or it may have been around voting as well. I may have voted, and then uh, I said, well, I'm here. So then I'm like, what the hell? So now all of a sudden, I call uh, State Senator Royce West's office saying, hey, who do you know one of these other offices where I can just go ahead and get it renewed? I then go to another location uh, in Dallas County. 
I said, well, man, let, I, I start thinking, I said, hold on, let me, let, me try to, I said, let me try to figure out a location where a lot of black folk gonna be at. <laughs> uh, and so, so, I, so I go in and parking lot's jam-packed and um, the woman at the front, the Latina woman, she's like, no, nope, you gotta you, you got uh, you, you got uh, get an appointment. Uh, and so she's telling me how long it's gonna take and I'm like, are you serious? I'm going back out of town tomorrow. And the so the brother who was behind the desk, the brother was like, everything good? And I was sitting, I was like, here's what's going on. He was like, come on. And so she was, and then she's like, and so, and then she get an attitude. Wow. She then goes, oh, I guess it's good to be special. Yes, it is. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so it was probably going to be about a three or four hour wait because I think they gave it to me. I think I was like number 68 or something. Now, mind you, the office I left, it was only like three, about four or five people. Mm -hmm. Okay? It was about 60 some odd people there. And so I'm chilling. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm reading my phone. I'm like, no problem. Let me go ahead and do this here until his one sister came out. A bunch of them were like on break. And I was, so they, a bunch, because I was like, all the empty, empty cubicles. So I didn't, and so then I was like, hold up, that's the break room. So I switched my seat so that way they wouldn't see the back of my head. So they uh, walked out, and then the sister, she was like, uh, I walked out, she was like, uh, mm -mm, come here. She said, no, nah, uh, she said, uh, but man came in, told you were sitting out here. She said, no, nah, we got to get your driver's license. And so went ahead, knocked it out, processed it, had my driver's license the following week. But... They literally, what you just described, they were literally going to try to make this a three to four month wait. And if you weren't Roland Martin, it would have been a three or four month wait. Yep. That's the, that, and so that's what Wesley Hunt won't talk about. No Wesley, question. Wesley Hunt would not talk about the slow walk. And in fact, in fact, Wesley Hunt, why don't you go back when Scott Walker was the governor of Wisconsin? when the federal judge called his ass in and said, why y'all slow walking voter IDs? <sighs> See, Wesley want to act like we don't know. And then yeah. Wesley, do I need to remind you when the leader in Pennsylvania in 2000, I think it was 2012 or 16, he, it was 2012, he stood up and said, and said, quote, because of voter ID, Mitt Romney is going to win Pennsylvania over Obama. That's literally what he said. Mm -hmm. So, see, w w Wesley act like, we don't know. No, Wesley, we do know. So you can sit here and trot out your little six IDs and pull all that crap out, but uh, real black folks know what's going on and how your party, especially those racists in Texas, how they are changing the laws to read the elections because y'all cannot compete on policy. We'll be right back. Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr. Democracy in the United States is under siege. On this list of bad actors, it's easy to point out the Donald Trumps, the Marjorie Taylor Greens, or even the United States Supreme Court as the primary villains. But as David Pepper, author, scholar, and former politician himself says, there's another factor that trumps them all and resides much closer to many of our homes. His book, is Laboratories of Autocracy, a wake-up call from behind the lines. So these state houses get hijacked by the far right, then they gerrymander, they suppress the opposition, and that allows them to legislate in a way that doesn't reflect the people of that state. David Pepper joins us on the next Black Table, here on the Black Star Network. Hello, I'm Jamia Pugh. I am from Coatesville, Pennsylvania, just an hour right outside of Philadelphia. My name is Jasmine Pugh. I'm also from Coatesville, Pennsylvania. You are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Stay right here.
Folks, uh, Ethan Dunn has been missing from De Pere, Wisconsin, since February 18th. Uh, the 14-year-old is five uh, feet, uh, six inches tall. Uh, guys, put his photo up. All right, we don't have the photo. Uh, he's, four, he's five feet, six inches tall, weighs 135 pounds, black hair and brown eyes. Anyone with information regarding Ethan uh, is urged to call uh, the De Pere, Wisconsin Police Department at 920. Uh, this is his photo right here, 920-339-4078, 920-339-4078. Uh, the Tennessee Senate has passed a bill blocking local governments from passing police reform on traffic stop policies. Now it's headed to Governor Bill Lee's desk to be signed into law. The bill passed uh, on a floor vote in the House on March 7th over, over the objections of the parents of Tyree Nichols. The bill passed in the Senate 25 to 6 along party lines with all Memphis and Nashville Democrats voting against it. The bill, if signed into law, would, uh, would uh, directly nullify an ordinance passed by the Memphis City Council in the wake of the tragic beating uh, murder of Nichols. Uh, by former officers of the Memphis Police Department. Uh, that ordinance uh, prevents police from conducting low-level traffic stops, often called pretextual traffic stops. This is what we call, Gavin, Republicans don't give, not giving a damn about local power if they are not in control. So the, 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 the so-called people who hate big government, they are liars and hypocrites, and they would rather protect abusive cops than protect citizens. Oh, 100%. And first and foremost, I think it's worth saying that Tyree Nichols should be alive today. His family should have more than just his memory still with them today. But you're right. Of course, it's all hypocrisy when they say local control. They want Republican control. They want white control. After the death of Tyree Nichols, the city of Memphis enacted a series of reforms, good reforms aimed at reducing the potential for deadly traffic stops. You know, I don't know the specifics of the effects of the reforms, but what I know is that they would put a check on officers, black, white, and otherwise, who might be inclined to pull over black drivers for simply driving while black. And like you said, extremists in the state legislatures, like in Tennessee and states across the country, they don't like that. And so what we see here reminds us that these threats to our democracy go far beyond Donald Trump. We like to sometimes think that, you know, as long as we beat Donald Trump in, in November, then, you know, we don't have to worry about, uh, you know, threats to our democracy persisting. But those threats are alive right now. They'll be alive after November, even if Joe Biden wins the election. Uh, it's because all throughout the country, we have these extremist Republicans like the ones in Tennessee who built up these super majorities, allowing them to attack, you know, local control in this case, voting rights, reproductive freedom, books and the teaching of our nation's full history. And like I've been saying, we said it earlier tonight, we said it last week when I was on the show talking about Tennessee again, we need to see clearly what's going on and what we need to do to stop it, which is to vote. Um, Greg, uh, that's uh, your home state. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And these white boys ain't never going to stop me. I mean, John Gillespie, that punk, Representative John Gillespie, and another punk, Senator Brent Taylor, both them white boys is from the suburbs of Memphis, Shelby County. They're the ones who brought this bill to the floor. And, this, and, and Tyree Nichols' parents are there. Let's be very clear about that. That's why I brought up Dory Ladner. Dora Lander was a, hum a humanitarian. She said, we're all human beings. We all need to live in this country together, live in this world together. But she also said, I have to be unwavering, and we have to fight evil wherever we see it in order for all of us to live together. I'm going to take a step back for Mama Dory. I, I love Mama Dory. It's, it's a, she has a great loss. These people are open enemies. They're the enemies of our common humanity. you got this man's parents in the gathering. You two punks and all your punk friends in the Tennessee legislature was like, damn that. We, gonna, we want the police loose. This is what's going to happen. And when I'm not giving a vision of what might happen, like you teach the history lessons day after day in the, in, on the network room, we know what's going to happen. You're going to run up on the right one. You're going to run up on the exact right one. It's going to happen in November in this country in the elections. Uh, the punk who is now the head of the Republican National Committee, who was the chair of the North Carolina uh, 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 Republican Party, the one that Donald Trump praised because he was the one training all them poll watchers to go and uh, look at people, look over people's shoulders in, in line. Y'all going to look up over the right shoulder this November. You're going to push people until they have no option. You think somehow by passing this legislation that lets the police loose and, 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 and takes local control away, the people just going to go away. Oh, well, damn. I guess we can't do it, so I guess we'll just lose. As you, as you heard Gavin say, voting is something now that becomes an act of defiance, an act, a weapon of conflict. And so that's why we have to embrace it. But guess what? 
If you show up with your funky MAGA hat on and a camera poking it in people's face, talking about you're going to watch them and say, hey, where'd you get that water? Or something like that. You might look around and find out. You might look around and find out. And then you'll wish that you had just let people vote or let people not be brutalized by the police. But you can't keep passing these kind of laws and expect people ultimately to just go away. All you are doing is shortening the leash. You're shortening the time before people say, since we can't do it this way, we're going to do it another way. And the John Gillespie's of the world are going to find out at that point, the Brent Taylor's of the world are going to find out at that point that they had a chance to do the right thing. But now, his brother said in the uh, in the wire, as Marlo said, you think it's one way, but it's the other way. And y'all gonna fuck around and find out. Rebecca? You know what? There's about 39 million black Americans in this country. We are the most targeted ethnic group in the world when it comes to police brutality, when it comes to state um, um, brutality um, against us. Like what Dr. Carr said, even what Gavin said, they simply want to erase us. They don't want us to be here. They would rather die themselves. They would rather stay poor themselves. They would ha rather have bad um, education outcomes or health um, outcomes, housing outcomes, have a crumbling infrastructure in this country than dare do something that actually also benefits black Americans in this country. And, you know, and even what Dr. Carr said, you know, people with that type of pathology, there's nothing we could say or do to convince them otherwise. But what we can do we got to show up in November. We got to be able to vote them out. We know that even with all of the, the, with everything that's against us, with the voter suppression in this country, if we still can manage to squeak out and vote as maximum as we can, we know that we will overcome them at the ballot box. But then, once we overcome them at the ballot box, we have to really hold the new elected officials' feet accountable. We have to make sure at the state level as well as the federal level that they get rid of qualified immunity. Qualified immunity is what prevents us from actually going after people's pensions. Because if you go after a pension fund, then guess what? You're going to start to clean up um, law enforcement in this country because this country runs on dollars and cents. And if we're actually able to make it hurt in the personal pocketbooks of these perpetrators, then we'll start to see a decrease in the attacks by law enforcement against black folks in this country. Uh, folks, a Mississippi police officer is accused of forcing a person who was being booked in jail to lick urine off the floor of a holding cell. Former patrolman for the Pearl Police Department, uh, Michael Christian Green, this is his photo right here, is facing one federal count of deprivation of rights under color of law, according to a criminal information filed earlier this month. The document alleges that the man Green arrested knocked on the door of a holding cell and said he needed to urinate. After a while, the man urinated in a corner. Green allegedly threatened to beat him with a phone and commanded him to, quote, lick it up. Green stood in a doorway while the man, who gagged and later vomited in a trash can, did so, the document says. Green even recorded it on his cell phone. This is the kind of person right here, Rebecca, that fake, and, and now you notice, this is a federal complaint. Not the local DA, not, not the Mississippi Bureau of Investigation, but the feds had to indict his punk ass. <laughs> I expect a dumbass like him to do dumbass things. He looks like a dumbass. He acts like a dumbass. And he did something as a dumbass. The bottom line is, when I hear from people in the law enforcement community who talks about, oh, we're a professional, you know, we're professionals, then act professional. Do something. Don't allow for this to happen. Because guess what? This is probably not the first time that that officer has done something like this. It should not have to take the Justice Department to prevent and stop things from happening like this. So for all those who see something, you tell us, see something, say something, then you see something, say something, and do something to stop this. If you don't want the federal legislation that will have to happen, um, if you don't want the state and local legislation that's going to have to happen to actually have um, police reform, then do something. Voluntarily do something. But guess what? You all don't want to do anything. You want to uphold white supremacy. You want to dehumane people. You want them to act as dogs and, you know, as 
big as alley cats and dogs and all sorts of animals. That's how you treat us. That's how you see us. But like even with what, something that Dr. Carr was alluding to, at some point, you're going to mess with the right one. People are going to get sick and tired. And as an ethnic group, we're not going anywhere. We survived the middle mm -hmm. passage. We're going to survive this too. So you might not want to F around to find out what's going to happen when you get to the you when you get to that right one who's like I have nothing to lose because that's what that's the corner that you're pushing me into they don't want us there so why don't you voluntarily do something reform before we have to now make you reform Gavin this little punk was relieved and resigned on December 27th uh, the 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 criminal information charge was unsealed March 4th he pled guilty today. Gavin, you're on mute. You're on mute. I'm sorry, Roland. Go ahead. This should go without saying, but it's disgusting. It's inhumane. All people deserve respect and dignity, including and perhaps especially those who are going through our criminal justice system. I want to make two points. One, we got to talk about what's happening in our jails. Look, I don't know the race of the jailed individual who was the victim of this crime, but what I do know is that in Mississippi, Black people are only 39% of the state population, but 57% of the people in jail and 62% of the people in prison. And we know it's not because black people commit crimes at a higher rates. President Biden announced earlier in his term that he was phasing out federal contracts with private, private prisons, and that's awesome. It's also one of the few things he can do in his position as president. But we need to remember that in many cases, it's in state jails and prisons where misconduct on the part of guards is running rampant, including when it comes to sexual violence. And when it comes to jail, these are people who haven't had their day in court yet. They're waiting for that. So, so many times these victims are completely innocent, but even if they're guilty, no one should have to experience what some people in these situations have experienced. And I'm from Atlanta. This has been happening. What's happening the Fulton County Jail is unspeakable. They're, they they stopped accepting new inmates. I'm so sorry, Roland. I have to, to leave this space in one moment. I got you. Um, there's a man being held there who was found dead, completely covered in bed bugs in his mouth, all over his body, and yep. it's unacceptable. And the second thing is that elections have consequences in so many ways. Like you pointed out, the charges here being brought against the officer, they're federal offenses. That means they're brought by the attorney general. And had this happened in the Trump administration, I would not be surprised if these you know, charges wouldn't have been brought. The judge who oversees this case will be a federal judge. We know Trump did his best to stack the judiciary with young right-wing judges, but President Biden has been nominating and confirming judges at, you know, at a rapid rate, including black and brown judges. And of course, at the state and local level, we got to pay attention to these officials who are voting or not voting for who have so much power. And the last thing I'll say, this happened in the same county in Mississippi where those cops who call themselves the goon squad pulled up and beat up on two black men for apparently pure amusement. So there are clearly a lot of bad apples in that bunch. The perpetrator here has to be held, you know, accountable to the full extent of the law. And we can't let something like this ever happen again. All right, Gavin, we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Y'all, this is Michael Christian Green walking out of court yesterday. Uh, he faces up to a year in jail, $10,000 fine, 26 years old. Uh, the, the, the man who he made do that was Latino. Uh, and, uh, you know, Greg, uh, I get stopped by a lot of brothers who come out of prison who said, uh, man, uh, we watch you we watch you in the prison and jail cells. Um, mm -hmm. Y'all get a good look, uh, and you put him to work licking urine when he got to go to that federal <laughs> prison. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's the power of the Black Star Network right there, baby. <laughs> yes, sir. You know, what happened to his um, Tate Reeves Memorial bad toupee? Uh, or did he shave off ah. that up weep? I don't, what, this, I mean, this is his mug shot right here. I know. Y'all go ahead and show it. Come on. Yeah, there's the Tate Reeves tribute hat, uh, bought probably Dollar General, the family dollar, or one of the local finer establishments. And then he shaved it, huh? Well, as you say, maybe the brothers will get a chance to be a barber for him, too, while he's... Uh, oh, and again, the, 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 the man who made do it was Latino, so uh, all the vatos, y'all go ahead and handle oh. that. Y'all go ahead and yes, handle sir. that. Y'all go ahead and yes, handle sir. that. All right! Yes, that's but, it. But before, before, before I mention, you, you know, Pearl is east is just east of Jackson. Jackson tried to incorporate Pearl in 1968. It's right over the Pearl River from Jackson. They incorporated in 1963. That little town's about 60 percent black. That's part of that whole criminal enterprise you've been covering there over the go. last year or so with them trying to carve out these bedroom communities and create. Make sure that white boy don't get a job in that new police district they're trying to create in Jackson. And there you go. There you go. All right. 
Greg, Gavin, uh, Rebecca, I appreciate y'all being on today's panel. Thank you so very much. Shout out to Virginia Union University. Uh, I'm rocking their shirt this week uh, on today. So uh, glad to uh, glad to uh, uh, represent them as well. Uh, so, folks, I appreciate it. Tomorrow I'm going to be in Los Angeles. Uh, normally, the NAACP uh, pre-award show dinner is on Friday night. It's actually tonight. Uh, so, but I'm going to be there. The Image Awards is on Saturday, so we will be there uh, for that. Uh, and then I'm going to be in L.A. Monday and Tuesday. Tuesday, they have the premiere, the Netflix world premiere of the movie on Shirley Chisholm starring Regina King. Uh, we'll be live there on the red carpet uh, broadcasting and then live on the red carpet so uh, a lot of things happening uh, so folks please uh, support us in what we do uh, please join our Brina Funk fan club your dollars are critically important for the work that we do send your check and money order to P.O. Box 57196 Washington D.C. 20037-0196 Cash App is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal or Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zell, rolling at rollinsmartin.com. Rolling at rollinmartinunfiltered.com. Be sure to download the Black Star Network app. Uh, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Uh, you can check out our 24 hour, seven day a week streaming channel on the various platforms. Uh, Amazon News, simply go to Amazon Fire. You can tell Alexa play news from the Black Star Network. You can also go to Plex TV, Amazon Freebie, Amazon Prime Video. Folks, that's it. Also, oh, don't forget, get a copy of my book, White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds, available bookstores nationwide. You can also download uh, the audio version. Uh, it's available on Audible. All right, folks, that's it. I'll see y'all tomorrow from L.A. How? Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punch! I'm a real um, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America. All momentum we have now. We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?